Good afternoon. It is as thick as pea soup out there, and uh, we're very glad that we are, we are inside. And um, would you bow with me? Let's, let's pray together and ask God for, uh, uh, for thanks for the food uh, before we get underway today. Will you pray with me? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father and our God, as we arose from our beds this morning, as we shook our heads and began to realize the dawning of the new day upon us, we, we became aware of all of the ways in which you had renewed your promises to us. You preserved us, you kept us safe from all sin and evil while we slept, putting your holy angels of protection around the four corners of our bed, keeping our loved ones and our little ones safe from all sin and evil. Father, surely this is a picture to us of the way you are at work. Even while we sleep, you are the God who never sleeps. You are a tireless advocate for us always going before us, always proving yourself true. And Father, we can think of no greater exemplar of your faithfulness and uh, extending the purposes for your kingdom than through this place, the King's College in New York City. Father, we are partners in this room. The parents who are assembled here are partners in education. We are... uh, merely extending the good work that they have already done. And not just parents, but grandparents, friends, churches, all manner of uh, support has gone into bringing these, the most incredible students I have encountered in the United States to this place uh, for the purpose of uh, reaching the greatest city in the world through the greatest story ever told. So we thank you for today. We thank you for this food. And as we eat and drink together today, we pray it might be a foretaste of the time in which we will eat and drink anew in the kingdom of God, even as we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Amen. Please continue eating. I uh, want to give you an update today on... uh, What's happening this fall semester at the King's College? I'll try to keep my remarks uh, brief, pithy, poignant, and hopefully trenchant for you. Um, I am mindful of the fact the first time I ever spoke in public at the age of 14, my father, uh, who is a uh, godly pastor for, for 44 years in the same place, got right down with me eye level and said, there are two things you have to remember about public speaking. Number one, The brain can only contain what the bottom can endure. And number two, if you can't strike oil in 20 minutes or less, quit boring people. (laughs) I I want to begin with something that I uh, conveyed to our parents' council uh, yesterday. And by the way, there's so many people that go into making a weekend uh, like this work, chief amongst them being uh, uh, Vice President Eric Bennett, who... Uh, He sung my praises, but folks, let me just tell you, there is no greater champion for your child than Eric Bennett. He is remarkable in so many ways, and uh, if you want to talk about someone who is tireless, uh, we're a good match. I I didn't, I I was trying to motion over to him, this is not a competition, but but there is, there's uh, never any difficulty in either Eric or I getting up every morning and coming to work, and that's true. The faculty, staff, and, and, um, and, and others who work here at the King's College, the Board of Trustees. But Eric, Katie Corbin uh, it does all the event planning here. Um, and Katie, we want to thank you for this beautiful room and outfitting it in this way. Uh, for Megan Phelps for helping to organize all of Parents Weekend. Can we just give the, and, and the Parents Council who make all of this happen, can we just give them a round of applause? We want to thank them. 
I met with the Parents Council yesterday after a whirlwind trip day before yesterday. I think I covered about 3,500 miles in one day out there on the Husters telling the good news about the King's College in, in New York City to, uh, to new and existing friends. Um, and uh, one of the things that I uh, began with with them was something that uh, I conveyed to our incoming students uh, this fall at Convocation at Trinity Church just right across the street, which is always wonderful to have academic convocation in that uh, fantastic church where the Patriots walked. Uh, six signers of the Declaration of Independence are buried in that cemetery across the street. Uh, but one of the things that I began with in that opening convocation address was I told them the story about a friend of mine who is a, um, a film editor in Los Angeles. And um, his name is Mike. And Mike, one of the areas that he works in is he does documentaries for the Travel Channel. And as many of you know, in reality television now, there are no longer directors. There's just a producer, and then there's the film editor that puts the show together. So Mike was collecting the, these, uh, these video um, uh, tapes that were coming in from a program that he edits called, it's like Haunted Houses or something like this, and it's on the Travel Channel. So he was putting this together, and he noticed a, a discrepancy, and the discrepancy was this. Uh, he noticed that the film crew would go to a house where this paranormal phenomena was supposed to be happening, and if the house did not look creepy enough, they would just simply go somewhere else in the town and find a house that did look creepy and, and film that, and then put the two together. So he called the producer, he said, I have a little bit of an ethical quandary with what I'm seeing here. And he said, well, what is it? And he said, well... Um, they're going to these different houses, and what happens if people actually travel to Stamford, Connecticut, to try to find this house where all this, you know, these ghosts are supposed to be residing, walk up to the house and knock on the door, and they find out that this is not actually the house that they, you know, that this happened in on, on the Travel Channel. And this was the producer's response to this. Mike, this, no, this is L.A., right? Mike. The Travel Channel is not for people who travel. The Travel Channel is for people who stay home and watch TV. And uh, the reason why that came up to me, in uh, into my mind in connection with the King's College, is uh, that the King's College, every everywhere that we look in the national media, New York City is the central focus of attention of national news events every week. Right? You think about last week with the United Nations and the climate change protests. It's all happening here. You turn on your television and whether you're watching CNN or Fox News or whatever your media poison is of choice, it's, hap it's emanating from here. Uh, this is the pulse of the financial center. This very neighborhood is the pulse of the financial center of around the globe. So what I said to these incoming students and to the house leaders, uh, of the houses here is that the King's College is for people who want to rock New York City, not stay home and watch New York City on TV. So um, those are the kinds of students you have. They're competitors, they're ambitious, they're, uh, they're ready to wade into the great arena of debate that we find at that time. So I want to give you a little bit of an update as to what is happening here on campus. It's impossible to encompass all of the good things that are happening here. That would take the better part of the, the afternoon. But uh, we are off to a very uh, fast start this uh, fall. We had an enrollment boost this year in terms of the incoming uh, student class, a 22% increase o over last year. Retention is increasing. Overall satisfaction of the student body is increasing. And uh, we are definitely out there on the Husters right now looking for next year's class to find the same group of students that uh, are equal and worthy of uh, your students that are here on, on this campus. It's amazing to pause as we talk amongst one another to hear the stories of how your child got here and uh, the remarkable stories about where they heard about the King's College. And uh, so we're looking, we're already out, our, our admissions team is already fanning across the country and looking for next year's class. 
Um, many of you will know that uh, we have a new Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Mark Hitchley, uh, who's Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. He is a seasoned administrator coming to us from a similar position at Houghton College in New York. And um, he is already uh, well at work in making strategic uh, decisions uh, about academic programming that are affecting um, the college, and uh, he's working very well with the faculty already. Uh, this fall, we have uh, three new faculty hires, um, uh, a temporary position in history. We're doing a full national search for a permanent uh, history professor to come alongside Dr. Joe Lacante, who many of you will know, the Italian stallion, Joe Lacante, who produces a book about every three months. The joke is, please hold while Dr. Lacante uh, completes another book. He's got a major major book coming out uh, that's going to come out in coinciding with the films that are, there's two films on C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien that are coming out next year. Uh, Dr. Lacante has a book coming out on C.S. Lewis and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and their role in the Great War. Uh, this is the uh, centenary uh, remembrance of uh, World War I. And uh, you've probably re been reading Dr. Lacante's columns in the Wall Street Journal. But uh, in history, we have Stamenka Antonova, PhD from Columbia University, teaching with us this year, Linda Kong in, uh, in English, and Dami Kabaiwu, our new professor of finance with a PhD from uh, Rensselaer. Uh, we we're off to a this year we started the year with our with our house leaders and our student body leaders joining us with the statesmanship uh, Institute uh, that's a pretty good looking crew of people um, I uh, I enjoyed speaking with them these are some of the most able and capable student leaders uh, anywhere in the country and um, th this is not a stock photo uh, these impossibly good-looking people are all actually students at the King's College. Uh, one of the things that makes King's distinctive, in the heart of this secular city, I mean, this is the bluest of blue cities in the bluest of blue states, what keeps you going? What keeps you going is the unique spiritual uh, dynamic uh, that exists at the King's College. And so, all of our faculty, students, administrators, everyone, the whole campus together uh, is going through uh, reading regularly common texts and scriptures, uh, common devotionals written by the faculty. And this week it was amazing, this past Thursday, the entire campus uh, took the day, we, we didn't take off classes, but every single student and faculty member that chose to participate, but it was campus-wide, engaged in a day of fasting and prayer for the college, for the city, and for what God is doing in this place. And so the dy dynamic worship experiences that are happening here through Refuge are uh, truly wonderful to behold. I mentioned convocation uh, on August 26th. Um, uh, I'll reference uh, something that I said in that convocation address a little bit later in my uh, remarks at the end today. Our fall retreat, one of the uh, strategic things that we do after the first couple of weeks is to take everybody away to uh, Iroquois Springs Camp in, uh, in upstate New York. It's about two hours north of here. And to get all the student body away in, uh, in, a, in a nature setting, because there's uh, an awful lot of concrete uh, around here, if you haven't noticed, and uh, a t for a time for worship and engagement and to listen to faculty and staff members uh, really uh, teach from uh, the Word of God, and it, it's, it has a way of framing and bringing together the whole student body, because as we're growing, we actually cannot possibly get the whole student body at the same time in the same place uh, together on campus. Uh, it's one of the things we're, we're working on, but we are able to do that during the fall retreat, and uh, it's, a, it's a great time for, for house leaders to be building into uh, their various different houses and bringing the whole campus together in a spirit of uh, solidarity. Um, 
you see there uh, uh, pictures from the house competition uh, and the drama competition happens uh, during, during fall retreat. Uh, the interregnum theme this year, and if that's a new term for you, it's something you need to be familiar with as a parent. Uh, interregnum is a culminating event that happens in the spring semester in which uh, all of the different houses compete with one another in debates, in scholarship competitions, in art competitions, but the whole year they're engaged in various different uh, enterprises, reading competitions, and the drama competition was uh, at fall retreat uh, this year. And the, the interregnum theme this year uh, is mortality. And uh, my two little girls, Kate and Carolyn, came along for the ride at fall retreat this year. And, um, and Carolyn, who's my 11-year-old, we're watching that house competition. She did not know that there was a theme. So every single skit had to do with death. Um, and so she's like, this is pretty dark, you know. <laughs> is there something wrong with the King's student body this year? Uh, kind of like a, talking about pretty macabre, you know. And uh, so I was like, no, this is just the theme. They're, they're thinking about death this year officially. Um, I want to transition to some of the, the ways in which King's is positioning itself as, uh, as a national leader of uh, discourse in the, in the realms uh, of, of scholarship and, and thought leadership. And uh, here is a perfect example of this. This past summer, uh, I was introduced to uh, someone whose career I've followed actually for many years, Amity Schles, who has uh, written four uh, New York Times bestsellers. Uh, she's most well known for her uh, history of the Great Depression, really the gr best uh, history of the Great Depression ever written called The Forgotten Man. Also, she wrote uh, a prize-winning biography on uh, President Calvin Coolidge, and she is a national figure. Uh, you will frequently turn on uh, MSNBC, CNN, or Fox and see Amity Schles talking about uh, economics and juxtaposing that with what happened during the Depression uh, era. And I'm very proud to, uh, to, to announce to you today with a, a very um, a generous gift that the college received that Amity Schles is coming on board to teach at the King's College uh, as uh, a presidential scholar in the area of uh, the history of, of economics. And so our student body will have access to, to this person who, who really is a, 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 a very senior national figure, a senior fellow on the Council for Foreign Relations. Um, I, if I can boast just a little bit, this does not happen at your typical Christian college. And so we're very glad to have Amity Schles on board. She will actually be teaching a, uh, a class next semester in, uh, on the, the history of uh, the Great Depression. Um, another very exciting development in, uh, in, in our life and work is uh, the launch of the Phillips Journalism Institute at the King's College. Um, New York City is the mecca of media, journalism, and publishing, not only in the United States, but in the world. And um, one of the announcements that we made a uh, week before last was the appointment of Terry Mattingly as a senior fellow uh, in the uh, realm of religion and media. Terry Mattingly has uh, written a, a nationwide column, originally for Scripps Howard, now for Universal Press Syndicate, called Get Religion. If you're not following him, he is the watchdog that is out there helping interpret religion for the rest of the national media. He's a prominent voice, and for the past 20 years, he has been heading up the Washington Journalism Center at the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities in Washington. Washington, D.C. Uh, the CCCU had that Washington Journalism Center as a place for Christian college students all around the country to come to to get training in uh, reporting in the field of journalism, and it was the marquee program in all of Christian higher education. Uh, the people that uh, supported the WJC and Terry Mattingly came to me uh, over the summer and said, We've loved being in Washington, D.C., but Washington, D.C. is a one-trick pony when it comes to journalism. Everything is about politics. 
the center of journalism is in New York City, would the King's College have any interest in the Washington Journalism Center uh, moving to the King's College at New York City? And uh, so that has happened. This major program of the CCCU is relocating here next year. This is an entailment of our joining uh, the CCCU, the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. Uh, if, if, if you're unfamiliar with that organization, it is the national organization that brings all of the Christ-centered institutions together in uh, one place. And uh, the CCCU does a lot in terms of advocacy uh, for uh, faith-based higher educational institutions. You know there are profound threats to religious liberties. Uh, they are a lobbying arm for us. They provide resources to faculty, staff, and students as well. And we have joined as, a, uh, as an affiliate member of the CCCU. Uh, the other affiliate members, just for, uh, for the record, are Baylor and Pepperdine. So we're in pretty good company there. Um, the Center for Theology and Culture, which will be uh, launching next year. This is a frightening photo of uh, Dr. <laughs> Anthony Bradley. Um, but uh, Dr. Bradley is a, is a premier national voice and, and speaker in the realm of theology and culture. And um, uh, we are looking forward to launch, launching a center that would make the King's College a, a national conversation place for uh, the future of religion and human flourishing uh, in this country. Many uh, amazing uh, events happening throughout campus. We celebrated Constitution Day, which is a federal requirement, on September the 16th, a day actually before Constitution Day. Uh, we commemorated uh, the, the 1965 uh, 64 Civil Rights Act here in the city room. Professors Tubbs, Bradley, and uh, Carl led us in a reflection on that. And then just to loop back around, the, the Phillips Journalism Institute in this room, Two weeks ago, uh, we launched the Phillips Journalism Institute, which will come alongside the Washington Journalism Center that is moving here. So now, Christ not just King students, but Christian college students from around the country will be coming here. Simultaneously, this is becoming a gathering place for people that are, um, that are faith-friendly who are in uh, the, the national media. And so in this room last uh, two weeks ago with the launch of the Phillips Journalism Institute, uh, you see here a picture of uh, kind of a packed out house here. These are some of the most notable people in national media that were here all uh, wanting to come alongside the King's College. People from The Economist, from The Washington Post, from The New York Times. And uh, the most exciting aspect of this for me was uh, I had a professor from Columbia uh, University Journalism uh, School come up who was actually on our steering committee for this event and said, um, this is marvelous to see Christians interested in journalism because journalism is interested in pursuing the truth and to see Christians interested in pursuing the truth. Now, this is what we should be all about. But to be able to do it through the, the voice of the media is one of the most necessary things that we can do at this time. Because who isn't out there complaining about the media? We have a, we're in a position to help change the tone and temper of the national media conversation here. Uh, and the Phillips Journalism Institute is, is uh, being supervised by our star uh, journalism prof, uh, uh, Paul Gladder, who uh, was a... Was a um, uh, star reporter for the, the Wall Street Journal for 12 years before coming here to King's. And if you don't know the name John McCandlish Phillips, you should after who the Institute is named. John McCandlish Phillips was one of the uh, premier investigative journalists of his, journal, uh, of his generation in the 50s, 60s, and 70s at the New York Times, uh, but was also uh, well known for being an outspoken Christian. But he cracked some of the biggest stories in the history of the New York Times. There's been a book um, that's written about him. And so his estate has uh, give, kindly given us his name. And so his legacy continues here. Now, I want to transition to something you may have already heard about. But I think it's a nice illustration of this principle of um, uh, the King's College is not for people who want to stay home and watch New York City on TV. Uh, last week, you could not turn on the news without 
hearing about the, um, the, the climate march in Central Park, um, hundreds of thousands of people. And then um, the very next day, on Monday, they relocated to our neighborhood down here in the financial district uh, in the hopes of shutting down the New York Stock Exchange. And um, I have a conspiracy theory that they were also trying to shut down the King's College as well. Um, <laughs> So now this is a national news story and, and they were out in the streets protesting um, uh, big business and its role in climate change. And so uh, a couple of intrepid young men from the House of Reagan took to the streets uh, with a life-size cardboard cutout of Ronald Reagan and uh, some in Reagan Bush 84 t-shirts. Um, uh, others in the, uh, the, the classic uh, blazer and gray pants um, that is the, that is the uh, emblematic uniform of the conservative cabal in a way, I suppose. But they took the streets and uh, waded into that sea of protesters and said, listen, we, we can debate uh, the whole uh, merits of the climate change argument. That, let's set that aside. But to tar the whole thing as being a, a result of... Uh, the negative influences of capitalism is uh, absurd. And so they went out and debated them. They got national media attention. They were everywhere. They were, they were ubiquitous. And um, who, who are the boys from the House of Reagan that, that were here? Taylor and, and Taylor, Taylor and Tyler, they're, they're all here. Let's salute these guys. I mean, this, that's amazing. Uh, if you go on to YouTube, th this created such a buzz around, uh, around the city and around the nation. I had Todd Starnes write me from Fox News, and he was like, whoa, this is awesome. You know, like, uh, I'm putting this on the front page of Fox News. Um, there's a video on YouTube that Elite Daily did kind of chronicling a little mini documentary on, on these guys. And so um, uh, news was being made outside our door, and so our guys decided to go out there and make news. So uh, that's the King's College. Uh, another e exemplar of the kind of uh, national conversation point uh, that the college is becoming is that this past Monday night, now these examples that I'm giving you are all just things that happened within the last two or three weeks. I'm, uh, I'm trying not to overwhelm you here, but this past uh, Monday night, um, I was contacted earlier this year by Dennis Prager, and uh, he was saying, you know, I I'm interested in Kings. Uh, how could we create sort of a, a conversation about religious liberty and faith and freedom in the public square? And so we put together a very interesting panel uh, here in New York City this past Monday night with Kirsten Powers from Fox, which uh, if any of you know Kirsten, she's fiercely independent. She does not tow the party line. And so I thought, well, this could be kind of explosive if I put Eric Metaxas, Kirsten, it's sort of like a you know celebrity death match, you know, Kirsten Powers, uh, Eric Metaxas, and Dennis Prager in the ring. I was just the moderator. I was the referee uh, of the whole thing. But we will have that video up for you soon. It was an electrifying conversation, but... Uh, but to get uh, the King's College on the radar screen of people like Dennis and Kirsten, um, they're now friends of the college and uh, will continue to tell the good word about what's happening at King's. And uh, that video will be uh, available soon. Our faculty are uh, the best anywhere. And uh, currently, um, uh, there's many, many different faculty um, uh, examples of scholarship that are making an impact and effect in the national media. Let me just give one of those. This week I was, I always habitually read George Will's column uh, in the Washington Post. And I'm reading down like, whoa, he was quoting Dave Corbin and Matt Parks, who are professors of politics at the King's College, in a recent essay that they did on federalism and the need for congressional term limits. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing. Uh, the, the, the mission of the King's College is that through the truths of Christianity and a biblical worldview, the King's College uh, helps to prepare students for careers in which they will help to shape and eventually to lead strategic public and private institutions and by enabling and supporting faculty as they speak into the public square on critical cultural issues. That's happening. 
Here's another good example of it. Don Fotopoulos, um, our beloved business prof, has a major new national book that is, has been published by the American Management Association called Accounting for the Number of Phobic. Great title. And one of the blurbs on the back says, for all of you starving artists that own business, businesses, would you like not to be starving anymore? Uh, there's a way to run your business in an orderly uh, fashion. This is a book that has been published by the American Management Association, and Don is on a national book tour uh, right now in support of this um, event, and this week we'll be having a book release party here on campus for that endeavor. Uh, one more final uh, uh, event that's coming up for the student body that's a, a nice little cookie that's happening this week. Uh, one of my very good friends, uh, Tullian Tavidjian, uh, I don't know how many of you know of Tullian's work. His, uh, his uh, books on, um, on the gospel are some of the finest right now. He's the pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And... Uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, that was D. James Kennedy's historic pulpit. Uh, Tullian is one of the most articulate voices, grandson of Billy Graham. Um, he has become very uh, attracted to and intrigued with what's happening at the King's College. And so Tullian uh, said to me a few months ago, could I sort of be a, a pastor at large for the King's College. And I said, sure. So we expect we're partnering with, with Tullian and liberate his organization. He'll be here on a fairly regular basis. But the first uh, uh, example of that is uh, here on uh, August, uh, October 9th. Uh, this week at noon, he'll be speaking here uh, in the city room on the subject of grace. And uh, we all certainly need to hear uh, fresh supplies of, uh, of, of teaching and preaching about God's grace, especially for those of us that are living here in the city. I want to close uh, today by returning to something that I said in my convocation address at the beginning of the year. Uh, this past summer, I had the opportunity uh, with, uh, along with Eric Metaxas and Joe Lacante from King's, to speak at the C.S. Lewis uh, Summer Institute at Oxford University and Cambridge University. And uh, while we were there, we hosted a group from the Charles Coulson Center for Christian Worldview in Washington, D.C. And we were going to be in London, actually, to hear, um, to, to meet with Canon Andrew White, the vicar of Baghdad. Um, so, uh, and this is just as things were really beginning to get very, very uh, dire there, but he happened to be in London, and so we were doing an event with Ken and Andrew White and Eric. But on our way, we thought, why don't we stop? This church that, that the event was happening at was very close to uh, Clapham Common. And I said, why don't we take some of the folks in the group and go visit Holy Trinity Church uh, in Clapham? Now, if that name doesn't ring a bell to you, um, let me draw it in a little closer and say why this was a historic uh, site. This was the church that William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect all worshipped at, and they all bought houses together there in London, the greatest city in the world, and there was a, there was a team, uh, a concentrated power team. It was the original Justice League of business, political, uh, journalists um, and other leaders, pastors, who were dedicated to the abolition of the slave trade and the reformation of manners in England. And we approached this mammoth building that uh, is, is uh, showing wear and tear, and it's the original building from that time. There's a blue seal above the door of that church. And when I read it, it I began to weep because it said, William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect worshipped at this place in their campaign to rid the British dominions of slavery, 1833. This was a tiny group of people that understood that being at the key point of inflection for cultural change, which at that time was London, England, if they band together and got business, politics, media, and the church 
rallying around the same cause, they could change the world. And they did for an entire generation. And forever, they changed the way the world thought about the issue of slavery. Never again would anyone say that chattel slavery was something that could happen without being opposed in the civilized world. We have that opportunity here in New York City for a new Clapham sect, for a new group of dedicated people who are fanning out into the strategic institutions of this city. We had a lunch a, a couple of weeks ago with a friend from the college, and I just invited some of the students that were available at last minute's notice to come in. And after it was over, uh, Eric Metaxas was at, I invited him to come to this lunch, and he said to this uh, friend of the college afterwards, he said, you know, it, it's entirely possible that you could have gone uh, 10 years in a given department at Golden Sachs, Goldman Sachs and never met a Christian. And this young man <laughs> is going to work for Goldman Sachs after he graduates. The, 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 second, uh, the second student uh, had just gotten a job as a men's buyer at Barney's uh, here, um, a culture shaper, Barney's uh, department store. And um, Eric was saying, you could have got, I, I've been here in New York City for 20 years, okay? I used to be, I knew every single evangelical Christian <laughs> 20 years ago. You would like see them on the street and you're like, you know, There is not that many of us here. And now, now there's a Christian at Barney's. You could have gone decades and not met a Christian at Barney's. We are in the right place at the right time for the right reasons, for Clapham-esque uh, potential. And uh, I, don't, I, I can't speak for other college presidents at other places. But here's what I know uh, to be the potential here. Your student has the opportunity to participate in something potentially very historic. So thank you for sending them to us. Uh, we understand that it is a high trust and charge uh, with which you have given us. And uh, in so doing, uh, we, we are aware of our responsibilities here. So thank you for coming today. May God bless you, and may God bless the King's College in New York City. Thank you very much.